All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar. I've got four o'clock here on the East Coast, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for joining this webinar. Are your employees all in for you and your company to win big? My name is Jeff Murphy. I'm an associate director in the BU Alumni Relations Office, as well as a proud alumnus of the BU Graduate School of Management. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Boston University Alumni Association and is offered to our 300,000 alumni around the globe. Throughout your career, the BU Alumni Association is committed to helping you define and achieve your professional goals. We aim to do this by providing alumni with access to a series of valuable online tools and social media communities. It's important to us that we get your opinion on how we're doing, and so we very much look forward to receiving your feedback via a survey that you'll all be emailed later today. So for those of you that I know are joining us from as far away as Sri Lanka, uh, please know that we really do value your opinion. We hope to hear back from you and um, as much feedback as you can give us in that survey. I read each and every one, so please make sure you fill that out and let us know how we're doing. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, some brief housekeeping notes. As you know uh, by now, this webinar is being hosted on the Adobe Connect online meeting platform. If you experience any trouble at all with the audio or visual portions of this presentation, I ask that you please contact Adobe Connect directly, and I'll give you that phone number if you want to jot it down. Uh, Adobe Connect can be reached at 1-800-422-3623. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be made available for on-demand viewing on the BU Alumni Association website, which you can find at www.bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is very eager to answer any questions that you have, and you are very welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A chat box that you see located at the bottom of your screen. We hope to get to as many questions as we can during today's webinar. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for the day, BU Law School alumna Marla Grant. As an experienced attorney and corporate executive, Marla leverages her analytical and leadership expertise to empower leaders to attain valuable business and career results. She utilizes high impact strategies and solutions to help leaders clarify and achieve specific goals for peak success and satisfaction. Marla helps clients fully engage and mobilize their employees, gain more influence inside and outside their organizations, successfully transition into new roles, avoid burnout, improve workplace relationships, and accomplish better organizational effectiveness. Having successfully transitioned into different careers, she's also an expert strategist in career transitions. Marla began her career as a litigator after receiving her law degree from BU. She specialized in civil and commercial litigation and gained extensive experience representing clients in numerous industries. After many years, she left her successful litigation career to pursue one that was more fulfilling to her. She's now a full-time consultant, coach, trainer, and speaker, and we're very delighted to have her here today. Marla, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get your slides up and ready to go. You might see a uh, brief delay while we do but the floor is yours, so take it away whenever you feel like getting going. Thank you so much, Jeff, for the introduction and for having me today. Hello, fellow Boston University alumni. As a proud graduate of Boston University, I have a lot of respect for my fellow BU alumni, so it is a true pleasure and honor to be here with you today to discuss a topic that I feel very passionately about, authentic employee engagement. Before we dive in today, I want to give you just a bit of background as to why I'm here to share these strategies with you. And then we'll discuss why employee engagement is needed now more than ever before, as well as some of the common challenges that leaders face when it comes to engaging employees. We'll review the significant benefits of having a fully engaged team and then get into some of the specific success strategies on how to fully engage, mobilize, and inspire your employees. Towards the end, we'll leave some time for any questions that you may have, and I'd love to hear about any strategies or best practices that any of you may have in place or that you use and that you find particularly effective. I also have a summary handout available that uh, will detail the strategies and specifics that we're discussing today for those of you who may be interested. So um, before we uh, get started here, I just wanted to um, take a quick poll and get a sense of uh, who here 
currently is in a position where you manage or supervise uh, employees. Okay, so far it looks like the grand majority of everyone here um, is in uh, a position where you're currently managing or supervising employees. Uh, for those of you who may not be currently managing or supervising employees, I think a lot of what we discussed today will be helpful to you um, if you do get into a role that involves managing employees. And also it just helps, I think, in general with a lot of um, having more effective and effective workplace relationships. So let's take a, a a quick look here now. Thank you very much, Jeff, for that um, polling question. Uh, just a quick background here. After I graduated from Boston University School of Law over 10 years ago, I had assumed that I would follow a traditional path and practice law for my entire career. But that definitely did not end up being the case. I began my litigation career as a civil litigator specializing in civil, commercial, and healthcare litigation. I spent a number of years representing individual and corporate clients. Ultimately, all my hard work paid off. I got excellent results for my clients. The partners that I worked for had respected me. I had established a good reputation for myself, made great money, and my career was advancing. So one might think that I was on top of the world. Not so much. On paper, it seemed like I had it made. But over many years and many, many, many billable hours, I stopped enjoying the practice of law and ultimately began to feel drained by it. So I decided to leave a successful litigation career in pursuit of one that was more fulfilling to me, and I ended up using my law degree in less traditional ways. I transitioned out of law and into executive management. I became a division vice president for a global technology that served uh, a, a global technology provider that had served the legal profession, and I oversaw the entire relationship management team and got to rely heavily on my natural leadership and management skills. Ultimately, I decided to take my combined experience in law and management and transitioned into executive consulting. So now I work directly with leaders who manage employees and I help them achieve their professional and business goals, including how to have a more engaged and mobilized workforce. As a lawyer who worked in the law firm environment, as you can imagine, I had to work with a wide range of different and colorful personalities among the partners who I worked for, the colleagues who I worked with, and the staff members who I oversaw. Many years later, as vice president, again, I had to work with many colorful personalities and had the added challenge of having to cultivate effective relationships and manage employees remotely. In all of my roles, the employees who I oversaw respected me, trusted me, felt heard by me, and were willing to go the extra mile for me more than for other leaders. Over time, I realized that this was because I had natural leadership ability to effectively engage and mobilize employees. I was essentially tapping into an intuitive ability to use a lot of the techniques that we're going to be discussing today, and which only later in my career did I learn our, our actual strategies used to help leaders have a more engaged and productive uh, workforce. Many of you may already use many of the strategies that we'll be discussing today. And like I said, I'd love to hear more during our Q&A about what you find particularly beneficial and effective. Regardless of where you are, though, I hope that you can build upon what we go over and um, ultimately have a more engaged and inspired workforce, increase your bottom line results, and be more effective leaders. So the big question. Are your employees all in for you and your company to win big? I hope we have some poker players in the house. As an avid poker player myself, the term all in really excites me and I hope that it excites you too. For those who are not as familiar with this poker term, to go all in basically means to lay all of your poker chips on the line to bet on a hand to win. You are risking everything for the win. 
or here, how we can analogize it in the business context, it, it's essentially like being completely 100% committed. I use this metaphor because I think it is such a powerful way to show that authentic employee engagement is when your employees are willing to give you their 100%, lay all of their effort on the line to deliver for you as their leader and for the company as a whole. They genuinely want to be totally committed, as productive as possible, and go the extra mile to be all in to give you their best. So I'd like to take this opportunity now to just poll the group um, on another question about finding out whether you feel like you already have successful practices in place to fully engage your employees. Okay, so we have maybe about a third, looks like maybe 40% or so find that they currently have some successful practices in place. Okay, we're getting some more results in now. It's kind of half and half. Okay, great. Look at why employee engagement is needed now more than ever before. Employees are more cynical than ever about leadership. Given the advancements that we have in technology now, people are hiding behind email, texting, and social networking. It is as hard as ever to adapt to the fact that people communicate and process information differently. And a new generation of workers demands to be inspired. Many organizations are continuously facing the problems associated with low employee morale, um, including complacency, widespread discouragement in the workplace. And if these problems are allowed to persist, then ultimately it's going to reduce productivity, earnings, and com competitiveness for companies in their businesses. Let's see if any of these common challenges that leaders face resonate with you. Um, but this is what we find to be very typical for leaders who are struggling with en engaging and mo motivating their employees. Do you feel like your employees are not doing what you need them to do? Or perhaps you feel like you're not getting enough productivity from them? Do you maybe have a strong technical background in your field? You have deep subject matter expertise, but you never received any formal education on how to effectively work with others in a leadership role? Does performance in your unit show low employee morale or higher than average turnover? When it comes to turnover, does it seem like your, your company is, is a revolving door? Are you receiving any negative feedback from employees or from your manager about how you are not engaging employees? Or are you having issues recruiting, retaining, or developing top talent? These are some of the most common challenges that leaders are facing when it comes to um, managing their employees. When you have a very effective engaged, inspired workforce, uh, some of the benefits to you as a leader and to the organization can be huge. For example, um, one of the biggest benefits is higher productivity, and that, of course, directly impacts your bottom line results. Another major, imp another major benefit is better teamwork among your employees. A big better benefit for you as a leader is to have increased comfort and confidence leading your employees. Additionally, you could expect to uh, experience improved impact and leadership presence. Ultimate benefit is to increase employee morale and decrease very, very costly turnover. Another benefit is de developing your internal talent to assume greater responsibility and to make continuous improvements so that they will move up in the company and that would ultimately help your company have a good succession plan in place. And lastly, a big ben benefit for leaders is freedom, essentially. This would allow leaders to have more time 
to spend on strategic issues and less time on dealing with fires and some of the hassles um, that employee challenges could raise. So before we get into the specific success strategies, um, I'd like to ask the group one additional question to find out whether your managers or the individuals who you report to are succeeding in motivating you. Okay, um, looks like most of the results came back showing that the grand majority are not feeling that they're currently being motivated by the people that they report to. Looks like a, a very small percentage feels currently engaged and inspired, and I think that's fairly representative of um, what most search shows anyway. So thank you, Jeff, for that, for that polling question. Um, so now we're going to get into some of the specific success strategies on how to effectively and authentically engage and mobilize your employees. Um, on a personal note, I'd share that I've experienced both ends and extremes of the spectrum. Uh, when I was a teenager with a part-time job as a hostess in a restaurant, I remember that my boss came in one day uh, when I was working and um, he was upset that I answered uh, a customer's phone call when he was there uh, in front of me having a conversation with another individual. I guess that really upset him. And so he uh, berated me and uh, chastised me in front of all of my coworkers and the entire restaurant. And it was really a very humiliating experience. And that was his way of um, giving me feedback that he wasn't happy with what I had done by taking that phone call and then on the other so that's like an example of an extreme uh, employer who um, doesn't really know how to resonate with employees how to connect with them inspire them and engage them to be better and on the flip side of that I've worked with many employers who knew exactly what to do to keep me motivated engaged and inspired so that I was willing to give them my hundred and ten percent um, work on the weekends, do whatever it took to basically give them my all and my best work. So uh, it's really interesting um, how Im impactful your direct boss can you know, be when it comes to whether you are uh, an engaged employee. So the first uh, success strategy here is really understanding that the key to all of this and what really cracks the case is going from looking at your employees as a generic them and instead treating them individually, engaging them individually because people are not motivated in groups but as individuals. So the common mistake that leaders make is to often look at this as a them. So once you can switch that mentality uh, and, and treat them individually, that alone is going to create a huge shift in the results that you will see. So what you could do is start out by listing each of your employees and ranking their performance by both percentile and growth potential. So by percentile is just by ranking them, you know, whether you categorize them as in your top 10%, 25% or 50% or your bottom 50, bottom 25 or bottom 10%. And then after you've ranked them by percentile, you can then rank them by what you consider to be their growth potential or their growth trajectory. And so some examples of how you might rank them in that regard could be you could classify them as in over their head in their current role, or maybe they're in just the right place. Perhaps that's an individual that needs to be challenged but is not quite a flight risk yet. Maybe that person is just ready to move up or could reach senior management or be a, a future superstar in the company. So once you've kind of gotten a good handle on how you're ranking your employees' performance, then you might want to figure out who do you want to focus first? Who do you want to tackle when it comes to uh, the changes that you want to create with your employees? You might want to start with focusing on your top performers, your very top 10% or your top 25%. Or maybe your bottom uh, your bottom employees or your you know um, low performers. So however you want to figure out 
who you want to focus on first, you decide. And then the main key is to get to know your employees. By knowing the commitments, the aspirations, the individual styles of each of your employees will make it so much easier for you to understand how to best engage and mobilize that employee. So for each employee, ask yourself, what do you know about his or her personal goals, their career goals? What really motivates him or her? What is that person's values? What talents, gifts, special skills do they possess? What is their learning style? How do they best learn? What's their communication style? What is their tolerance for risk or for change? What development needs might they have? It's a lot to get to know. I mean, there is definitely a lot to get to know here, but one of the most complex functions that a manager performs is employee motivation. And these are things that are key to know in order to be able to get, the heart, get to the heart of motivating employees. And what makes it even more challenging is that what motivates people changes constantly. But once you can get to the motivating factors and re really resonate with that employee, work for that person becomes an important part of their life. And when they're satisfied in their jobs, then greater productivity and increased employee morale will naturally become the consequence. So it's critical to find time to sincerely and authentically connect with your employees. And the other component to getting to know your employees is to develop a, a rapport with them, to develop a level of trust, because people will work a lot harder for you if they like and trust you. And I know that personally, because of the time that I took to get to know my employees, I was able to develop a level of trust with them that made them want to go the extra mile for me where I saw that they would not do for other managers or other leaders. Another um, key strategy here, oh, before we roll to that, I'd like to just take a minute to show you this slide. Uh, I'll let you go ahead and read it. And this is, this is so true, not always, but in many cases, this really drives home the point of, of how powerful of an impact one individual leader can have um, on whether you know, your good talent will, will remain or not. I've had employees tell me that if it were not for me becoming their manager, they would have quit the company. So it's really interesting that people often, not always, but often don't quit the organization or the company as a, as a whole, but they are leaving uh, their individual manager. The next key strategy for success is to individualize your messages for greater impact. I couldn't resist using this particular photo because it does represent the Boston University mascot. Um, but the key here that I'm trying to convey is that each employee may need to hear different messages and at different times. So as a leader, it's important to make sure that you are expressing all of the right messages to every employee so that each person understands how they fit into the larger picture so that they have a full context of where the organization has been, where it is going, how it will get there, and where that individual employee fits into the whole big picture. So examples of some of the types of high-level messages that you want to ensure that you are conveying are the following. History or closure. This is where you talk about where the company has been and what we have achieved in the past. Um, there's the vision messages. These are about, you know, explaining to your employees exactly where it is that we're going. If we as, as a company are going, what are our long-term goals and visions? There's the myth mission messages. Here is why what we are doing matters and how what you are doing matters. Values messages. Here's how I would like us to be as we get to point B. So, you know, these are the values that we stand for. Strategies and initiatives. These are the specifics of how we're going to get from here to there. Objectives. Here are the key metrics by which we are going to define performance. Commitment messages. What are your reasons for doing this? 
you as the employee, what are your aspirations and how do they fit in? Roles messages. Here is your specific role and why it's so important to the whole big picture. And support. What support or resources do you need from me or from the company in order to succeed in your role? What we find is that many managers tend to be sort of one trick ponies when it comes to the type of messaging that they give. And they tend to emphasize only one or two messages out of this wide variety of the plethora of messages that could be conveyed. So for example, some are stuck uh, you know, in the past and speak only of the glory days and the history. Some leaders are great visionaries and they'll tell you all about the vision for the company, but they don't let people know specifically what they're gonna do to achieve that vision. Some leaders are good at letting everybody know exactly what they need to do, but they don't help their employees really understand the big picture, how they fit in, or why they should even care. And some leaders drive people really well from one milestone to the next, but they fail to remind their employees of where they've been and acknowledge them for all of the achievements that they've accomplished to date, which can often create ill will or result in people burning out and ultimately um, leaving those positions. Very few leaders ask the support message, the support question, you know, how can, how can they help? Um, what support is needed for you to succeed? So by having greater flexibility in the types of messages that are being sent to employees, there's really much more opportunity to truly engage and mobilize each employee. So it's a great process to look at what messages do you tend to gravitate to out of all of these different types of high-level messages. And you know, where do you think you might need to start focusing, um, expanding the types of messages that you're conveying to make sure that everybody is hearing what they need to hear? Um, and more importantly, on an individual basis with your employees, where, you know, who do you think may feel like they're out of the loop right now or that they're irrelevant, unimportant, maybe not getting the whole picture to find out who you might need to um, get in front of? Another big strategy along the lines of individualizing your messaging is, is customizing your leadership style for each employee. So this is definitely not a one-size-fits-all type of approach because different employees require different approaches at different times. Many leaders know this intuitively, but very few leaders really think strategically about how to adjust their style given the needs of each individual employee. So consider having a strategy for each employee and realize that that strategy may and probably will change over time. So what you can do to start is for each employee evaluate what is the best leadership approach to take with that person right now and why. So you can figure out the types of conversations you need to have with that person, how you may need to spend your time with them, and how you can support them in their development. So some examples of the different types of leadership approaches to consider are, the first example would be removal. So this would be, you know, if you have an employee or you're simply not getting the results from them that you need, they're not performing, they have a poor attitude, um, you've already invested as much as you think is worth in that individual and you don't think that it's worth investing any more training time or energy in that individual, well, then the strat removal is actually a strategy. The strategy for that person is, is to terminate them. Another strategy is to redeploy. So this would apply to an individual who maybe is showing that they're not possessing the ability that is needed for their current role, but you recognize that that person has certain talents and other skills where they can be useful in another unit or another division or re redeployed in another role altogether. A third strategy is uh, to direct and inspect. This is the micromanage approach. Um, and not fun to do, but it is a crucial role for certain employees. This would apply to any employees who you just can't trust right now to get the job done, uh, or perhaps they're unmotivated and not showing full engagement, but you're unwilling or you're unable to remove them at this time. 
So you may need to, to micromanage or direct and inspect for a period of time to get them to where you ultimately need them to be so that you don't need to do that anymore. Um, the fourth strategy is to manage expectations and provide training. So this would apply to individuals. We often see this a lot with some of the younger generations where they may have um, unrealistic expectations that they're going to be promoted in an extremely short period of time or that you know, they're going to become the future CEO in maybe four or five months of being on the job. Um, this is an individual that you want to work with to manage their expectations, but to keep them engaged and provide additional training um, by showing them that, look, you know, you're not necessarily going to get here in three or four months. However, if you have this additional training, if you acquire these additional skills, if you do X, Y, and Z, then um, all, you're going to be on track to, you know, to get moving, you know, up the ladder where you want to be. Um, the fifth approach is to re-engage. So this would apply to any employee that, you know, is, seems to be bored, unmotivated, disengaged. Maybe this was a previous outstanding employee that you've noticed has somehow, um, you know, gone through something now that's resulting in, in a, a change in behavior and they're not really inspired or engaged anymore. Um, so it's about getting to know that employee, getting to the heart of what might be going on there that has caused that change and figuring out how you can re-engage that, that individual. Another strategy is to mentor and, adv and advise. This would apply to any employees that you feel are performing well, they're on track, um, they don't need a whole heck of a lot from you, but you are going to continue to groom them for the next level and to set up that succession plan for your organization. And finally, another strategy is to monitor results and essentially, you know, offer support as needed. So this is for the employee who is totally engaged, a uh, great performer, and doesn't really need anything from you other than to just um, stay involved to the extent of keeping them engaged. So you don't want to walk away. You don't want to abdicate responsibility when it comes to a star performer. Um, you do want to stay you know, with a pulse on making sure that that employee is getting the support that they need and stays as engaged as they are. Um, in addition to customizing your leadership style for each employee, you also want to make sure that you are customizing uh, the way that you acknowledge employees. So most all of us want to feel that we're appreciated. We want to feel valued and that what we do is important and has an impact. But different people react differently to different forms of acknowledgement and recognition. So many leaders don't really think about how they can recognize or acknowledge employees appropriately. And they're really missing out on one of the most powerful ways to engage and mobilize. So it's really important to think about what will work best for each of your employees. Because even if you have the best of intentions, if you don't acknowledge them the way that that employee appreciates, then you really risk alienating that person and having uh, the opposite effect of what you want. So for example, some individuals prefer to be acknowledged in public, whereas other individuals would be absolutely mortified and humiliated with the public recognition and only want to be recognized privately. So um, the strategy here is to, to understand with each of your employees what is their preferred form of acknowledgement. And then you can decide what, what you will tell him or her or how you're going to acknowledge that person and by when. So some examples of um, acknowledgement that wouldn't cost any money, for example, would be um, for those who like a public acknowledgement, it would be maybe public, a way of showing them public thanks or no cost uh, company awards or contest, um, perhaps a public display of progress or potluck meals that keep the costs down. That would be, those would be some examples, some idea joggers for ways to publicly acknowledge uh, employees that, that don't cost any money. And then for those who want to be acknowledged in private, um, options that really don't cost much would be, you know, private thanks, encouragement, a pat on the back, 
Uh, some people, you know, really are perfectly content with these verbal um, expressions of appreciation and, and don't really need much more than that to stay motivated and engaged. Um, other ideas could be offering that individual uh, maybe a new challenging assignment that they want, um, offering them a, a mentorship with someone or your own time, more of your own time if that's applicable. So beyond financial rewards, which we'll talk about in a minute, there's a lot that a leader uh, can do to recognize and acknowledge employees that doesn't even really cost, um, cost money. The key takeaway with all of this, though, is to make sure that it's sincere, obviously, it's a, it's a sincere way that you're showing that you value them, and that it's along the lines of how that individual prefers to be acknowledged and recognized. So for those of you who may be in a position at your company with formal power who can modify or impact your company's reward systems, then it's important to, to analyze the rewards to find out whether they are aligned with engaging and mobilizing employees. So examples of some of the types of rewards to look at would be um, the compensation structure, the bonuses that you offer, tuition reimbursement, paid time off, promotions, contests, performance reviews, honors and awards, or any other special acknowledgement. And for each of these, look at you know, which of these work and for which employees do they work? And what can the company improve upon uh, and for which employees? and by when. Uh, these are, that's sort of an outline of, of looking at, you know, um, making sure that your reward system is, is aligned with actually engaging and mobilizing your employees. Some examples of uh, rewards that cost money. So for public, for those who would prefer a public acknowledgement that costs money, some examples could be, you know, expensive group dinners or big group bonuses. Um, company awards or contests that involve money. Um, examples for private acknowledgement that costs money would be, you know, a raise, a bonus, or a gift for that uh, employee. Another success strategy to, to review is role design, to really make sure that roles are designed for maximum employee engagement. When people are, are well matched to their jobs, they're more likely to be satisfied at work. And of course, that's going to result in increased productivity and it'll decrease a lot of the negative outcomes that we see, like job related stress, tension, workplace conflict, and of course, costly turnover. And when we say well matched, we don't just mean well matched based on abilities, but we also mean based on the employee's interests and the employee's personality. Um, so with your with the, each individual person's role, you want to look at the top three key metrics for success in that role, and the top three key responsibilities and tasks. And then, what authority, if any, does that person have, and where does that authority end? You know, who would need to approve what and when? And what are the next career steps or advancement for that role? And after you've fleshed those things out, ask yourself whether those items describe, whether those items that we just described actually provide a clear role. And does it provide a role with enough autonomy and a role with purpose? Lastly, does it, does it uh, offer the opportunity for that employee to become an expert or a master? Now, these last three things I just mentioned, um, you know, Dan Pink, uh, who some of you may be familiar with as a thought leader, um, he did a really interesting 10-minute clip on uh, the truth about what motivates people. And he focuses on these three items when it comes to where people are motivated in their role. It has to be a role that provides autonomy, one that provides purpose, and one that would allow the person to become uh, an expert or a master. 
uh, the autonomy is just that you know people want to know that you're going to get out of their way. They want to be able to have that autonomy with what they're doing. Um, the the uh, purpose is you know to feel connected with that what they're doing really matters to them. And the expert or mastery piece is that it's fun. You know it's fun when you're doing something that you know you are good at and that you've mastered. In addition to role design, um, you know, this may look like it's just leadership 101, but believe it or not, even at the highest levels of huge organizations, leaders do not always set clear expectations uh, or provide clear feedback so that each employee really knows how he or she is doing and how to improve. So for each employee, you want to take a good look at how often you have to give feedback to each of them and what really clearly are you expecting from him or her right now? Because if you cannot clearly articulate it as their leader, imagine how confused that individual must be. So you want to be clear with um, what you want that individual to do and then to be clear on what are they doing well and what are they not doing well? So that if there's anything that you want them to do differently, what is it and when? by when do you want them to do it? If they are meeting your expectations and make those changes, what do they get in return for doing it? What are some of the informal ways you'll be able to reward them? And what happens, more importantly, if they don't? What are the consequences? Um, and what support does that employee need from you? This one is so powerful because when you ask that question to your employee of what support do they need, what resources do they need in order to succeed, that alone should create a different dynamic in the relationship because it really shows that you care and that you are invested in wanting to help them succeed. And the last point I would mention on this is that the feedback, when it comes to feedback, should flow in both directions because employees also want to hear, want to know that they have a voice and that they're being heard. Um, so making yourself as a leader approachable enough uh, to allow that feedback to flow from them to you is just as critical uh, when it comes to developing um, an effective relationship with your employees. Some leaders, you know, just will say, if anybody has any feedback on how we could do this better or how I could do better, please let me know. My door is always open. But most of the, most of the time, nobody's going to go and, and and approach that that individual where you're really going to get the feedback is if you directly ask that in, that person on a one-on-one -on -one basis specific questions about how you know you could communicate more effectively with them or what can you do uh, to more effectively clarify that person's role and set expectations or how can you listen better to their ideas and opinions so if you are really direct with somebody more in a one-on-one -on -one setting, you're going to get a lot more feedback from your employees than just, um, you know, throwing something out there like, see me if you have any ideas or feedback. Um, stories. This is so powerful. Telling stories that engage, inspire, and teach. Stories can be such an effective way to engage your employees because they tap into a different part of the brain than the usual analytical communication that most of us hear in organizations. So most of us are used to, you know, having information communicated to us through a lot of facts, logic, data, PowerPoints, bullet points, memos, and, uh, and that's fine to a certain extent as it, as it taps into the left brain. But if you want to talk about engaging employees, then you have to look at engaging the whole person. And the way you can do that is by engaging a different part of the brain, the right brain. So that's where we react to stories, to metaphors, movies, books. So by trying to become more flexible as a leader about how you communicate, especially with stories, you can resonate with your employees in ways that are different than the, the usual analytical way and be more effective in really inspiring them. So some ideas for the types of stories that, as a leader, you may want to look at tying in every now and again um, would be a key lesson about being a better leader or the best or worst leader that you ever worked with and what you learned from it.
uh, how a team came together despite difficult circumstances, or how your organization has evolved and where it is headed. Or you can share a story about a challenge that you overcame. And this is really powerful because it makes you just a bit vulnerable um, and it allows you to you know, become more relatable to that employee where they can really get that lesson from you. Um, you can build in a story using your favorite movie or book or a news story. Um, for example, I'll illustrate this point right now and talk about one of my favorite movies, which is uh, Office Space. I hope that some of you in the audience have seen this movie before. It's, uh, for those of you who haven't, it's a comedy um, about office workers in a software company and their bosses pretty much exemplify exactly what you should try to avoid doing as a leader. I mean, they really epitomize, uh, you know, how not to engage or inspire your employees. And there's a, a scene in the movie that I thought was interesting to illustrate this point where one of the employees um, made a mistake and he turned in their their daily report and he failed to attach a cover letter on that report and that was a new requirement based on a new policy that the company had implemented and so his boss um, comes over to him and you know lets him know that he failed to attach that cover letter on the report and the way he tries to make his point to the employee is by pointing to the fact that you know he didn't follow the memo. He said to the employee, did you get the memo? The memo that says that you're supposed to attach a cover letter now on these reports? And he kept pointing to the memo, pointing to the memo, pointing to the memo. And that's kind of like all of us. We're all inundated with bullet points, PowerPoints, memo, data, data, data. And when you talk to somebody and share a story with them or paint a picture for them in their mind, that really does have a completely different impact and resonates with them uh, to really get your lesson or, or your point across. And um, I'll also add that this, um, we're almost at the end here of our strategies, but this second to last strategy is developing leaders. Um, the best leaders develop future leaders. So if you can demonstrate a serious commitment to developing your employees for the future, you will greatly increase the chances for A, showing your employees that, you, that the company cares and is investing in their growth, and B, it really you know, creates a, a succession plan for your company's continued growth. So the key is to creating a development plan that has teeth, not just one that you do at the end of the year with the performance review and then it sits in somebody's desk for the whole year and doesn't really get acted upon. I mean a real plan that sets forth clearly specific long and short-term goals of what projects that employee is going to complete, what, um, what results is that employee expected to achieve, what changes in behavior does that employee need to do to be more effective, or what skills do they need to acquire. And then, you know, are there certain key people that they should be meeting over the course of the year? Are there mentors that they should be getting? Um, maybe some formal training programs or conferences, uh, new organizations that they should be getting involved in, any self-study or coaching that they should receive. Um, and then finally, you know, this is sort of the bonus strategy because really good leaders will be brave enough to point the finger at themselves first and ask, have I even earn the right to lead? Am I as a leader being how I need to be in order to truly engage and mobilize my employees? So ask yourself, you know, if you were an employee, would you want to follow you as a leader? How do you think your employees would rate you on competence, credibility, demonstrating personal commitment, having character and integrity? being resilient, serving others, caring about your employees, being committed to their success, admitting mistakes, going first and setting an example. You know, how do you think that your employees would rate you and, you know, who would agree that you do demonstrate these things and who do you think would disagree? Uh, and then I would just challenge you to come up with one specific behavior that you could immediately change right now to be a better version of you tomorrow. And I'll share with you that when I was a leader, 
I wor- the, the, the behavior I chose to work on was to try to let go of my tendency to micromanage and to learn how to trust my employees more and to delegate more to them. Um, time for some questions and answers. And I would love to hear from you um, about any strategies or practices that you have in place that you find particularly effective with your employees. Marla, thank you again. We do have a couple questions that are coming in and uh, to all of our guests, again, I would say, please feel free to use the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen to get those questions in. Or um, as Marla said, if you've got some advice to share from your own experience, please feel free to uh, to, to go ahead and, and chat that into us and, and Marla can share some of her perspectives on some of the lessons that you've learned along the way. Um, Marla, we've got one question that has come in from Melissa. Uh, you just a few seconds ago mentioned that you know in your past you had been sort of guilty of maybe doing a little micromanaging. Melissa's question is, how do you micromanage? How do you ensure that you've, you're providing that kind of oversight to an employee without just being really annoying? Without just being really annoying, okay. Um, there is a fine line that you do have to walk there because when it comes to micromanaging, um, you know, and that the term itself sounds very negative, so sometimes people like to say direct and inspect, but however you want to look at it, um, the bottom line is, is that you know you can't trust that employee to do the job without being heavily involved in the oversight. And so um, ways to effectively micromanage without necessarily um, being annoying could be if you are, you know, cluing that individual in, it, this goes to the communication piece and the messaging, if you're cluing that individual in as to why it's important for something to be done a certain way, for example, um, you're, you're sharing with them that this is so, you know, that you want to take a look at it or you want to help them do X, Y, or Z, or you want to be involved with this part of the process. Um, because it is so important that this be absolutely perfect when it goes out the door or whatever the case may be so that you are emphasizing um, the, the why that you're not just doing this because you want to be controlling or involved that they're you know that let's set the stage for them and paint the picture as to why it is so important and why you are having to do that um, strategy Great, thanks. Um, we've got a question that came in from Sean, and again, I'm paraphrasing here a bit. Um, Sean's question is, he's you know had trouble in the past connecting with employees who sort of felt like they were more kind of private people. Uh, any advice for you know how do you get to know somebody who maybe isn't quite so open or willing to you know become uh, professional friends in the office? Yeah, that's a tough one, uh, and I and I know that I. I um, had a little bit of that challenge because I had to foster relationships with employees remotely, which adds a whole nother layer of complexity um, because you don't really get the same access with the inter personal connections you get when you work in the same office with somebody. And so when you have somebody that's private uh, or doesn't really like to open up, you know what, what we're talking about really, it all boils down to relationships the way I see it is that it's all about fostering relationships with people because the bottom line is like I said people will work harder for you and want to do more for you and want to please you as a leader if they like you if they trust you if they feel heard by you so it's tough it's, it really comes down to building a relationship with with those people so if they're private and they don't open up I think it's a matter of time because everybody's motivated by something those private people have their own set of interests and likes and dislikes, and it may be take you. It may take you longer to figure out what it is, but doing things like if you're in a position where you actually work in that office with them, you know, offering to take them to lunch, offering to take them to coffee, and just continuing to get in front of them and have conversations with them as much as you can. Um, if they're remote, you know, being on the phone with them instead of doing a lot over email, because if we hide behind our email and texting, it's really hard to get to somebody, especially a private person. So when you're dealing with somebody who's closed off and not very open, you need to be, you need to get either as much on phone or in person time with that individual. And it may just be a matter of building a relationship with them and getting, you know, making them feel comfortable enough to open up to you. You should open up to them. So if you could share things with them, then they may feel 
uh, over time more likely to open up to you and, and to start to trust you. But I think with that one, it's it's a matter of just fostering the relationship. Great, thanks. Uh, another question um, uh, regarding uh, she's got. This person has employees who uh, at their company who have left for their own reasons, not as a result of any layoffs or firings, uh, but because of some of those staff vacancies, the rest of the remaining team is overworked and uh, morale is really down. So do you have any suggestions or advice on how to overcome a situation like that? Uh, yes, that, that's a tough one. I think that's something that we're seeing a lot of these days in this market for sure. Um, and with that, I, I think what ha can be effective is, well, we talked about acknowledging employees. So we talked about ways to do it that don't really cost money. Uh, so I think that it's really important with those employees that are left to kind of uh, take over the stress and strain that the, the gap has created of the people that left um, is to make them feel appreciated, to make them feel that uh, valued. And it can't just be in an insincere way. Like we all, you know, we really appreciate your great work. Make it really sincere. One-on-one uh, -on -one connect with those individual employees and let them know. Acknowledge them uh, in informal ways to let them know just how much you appreciate that they're putting in this extra time, effort, and energy during this um, interim period of transition. And um, in addition to acknowledging them, you know, asking them what support or resources do they need in order to do what, what you're asking them to do. And you're not promising them that you're going to give them those things, but you are going to ask them to find out if you can come up with a creative way to make this, you know, something that, that you, maybe you can offer them something that will make their lives a little bit easier. And maybe it's not a big deal for you to do. And but yet it can have a big impact from their perspective because they will feel like, wow, I just gave my employer a suggestion or a request or, you know, I asked if they could provide me with X, Y, Z resource. And this is what, you know, and they feel that they're being responded to. That will create a positive shift and dynamic in the, that should create a positive shift and dynamic in the relationship. So acknowledging, offering support, and just offering to listen to them. I mean, honestly, people often just want to be able to voice um, their frustrations, their concerns. So, you know, you as a leader can get with those employees and say, look, I know this, this is a difficult, challenging time right now. Uh, we're all working a lot harder than we were because of this transition or this change. And, you know, just let me know from your perspective, is there anything that I can do to, you know, to make your life easier or to help or this, uh, this or that? And that will open up um, a healthier dialogue. Great, Marla. You know we're running right up against the five o'clock hour, so this is perfect timing. Um, you know, I wanted to say uh, anybody I think who's ever been in a management position knows that supervising employees is not easy, and there's certainly no one size fits all model for how to do that successfully. And but I think you've provided you know our alumni with a really great framework for how to get started on you know analyzing how they're managing others and how they might be able to make some change in their style. So uh, on behalf of all of our alumni, uh, not just the ones on the call today. Uh, thank you so much for offering this session. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's been a pleasure to be here with everybody today. My thanks also go out to everybody who, who attended. I hope that you plan to join us for our next webinar, which is coming up in November, where we've got alumna Amber Nelson, who's going to present Effective Communications for Women in Business, Navigating Your Top Three Communication Traps. Um, having just participated in a session on good management, I'm sure all of you on our in our meeting today can appreciate that the session is not just for women. I think men will get quite a bit out of it as well. Um, you can sign up for that session now on our website, which again is at BU edu slash alumni and as always if you or any BU alumni you know would be interested in presenting a webinar just like this for the BU Alumni Association feel free to contact me directly at the alumni relations office or by email at jtmurphy at bu.edu thank you everybody for tuning in